This morning we continue our study in the book of James. We continue our study in this little stick of dynamite. You remember with me when we were studying the book of Jude, we said it's very short, but it's filled, it's, it's, it's absolutely packed with a punch. It has a great punch to it. All of the Word of God has that power. It's the, where we get the word dynamite from, the dunamis. It's the explosive power of God's Word. James is only five chapters long, but in these five chapters, there's, there's almost just no flowery language. It's very to the point. James is one of those guys. He must have been a CPA in his original training. I don't know. He must have been one of those guys that is um, an engineer, um, went straight to the heart and uh, looking at the facts, and that's where we come this morning is to the book of James. And we come to part two of this third test that we see in the book of James. It's the part two. It is the test of hearing and doing. Some of you have had a hearing test before. Some of you have hearing aids. Um, I know that my wife thinks that I need a hearing aid most of the time. She um, just kind of constantly says, didn't you hear me say that? Didn't you see that? And I'm going, what, what, what? You know, I mean, that's even last night. Came in from a long trip and um, trying to get settled down and um, all I could, I I couldn't hear very well. But indeed, God's Word is talking about hearing not with our ears on our head, but with the ears of our heart and our mind. God calls His people to listen to what He is saying. And not only does He call His people to listen to what He's saying, but very obviously, He calls us to do what He says. We often are very good at hearing and very poor at doing. And this morning, we want to see James' very powerful look at this Notice on your outline there, and you can kind of fill some of these things in as we go, but there are various tests that are presented, excuse me, the the, the letter of James is written primarily to help Christians, what we would kind of put in quotes as Christians, people who call themselves Christians, evaluate whether or not they are true believers, they are true followers in Christ. The question is, you say that you're a follower of Christ, but are you really? James is all about that. James is all about how do you know that you know that you know that you know Christ? And there are many who have misunderstood the story, the, the message of James because they um, conflict various other genres of Scripture with it, what the fact of the matter is, is that James is very concerned about people who have come in to the Jewish Christian life after Christ has returned to the heavens, returned to heaven. He's sent the Holy Spirit. The church is starting to grow in modern-day Turkey, in modern-day Greece, in Italy, across North Africa. The church is spreading. There's many who have come into these Jewish synagogues that had become places of worship of Jesus the Messiah, and there were many who were not true followers of Christ, and so James is trying to sort that out. Now, wise people ask some key questions. Wise pe- This isn't on your outline, just on the screen. Wise people ask this question, how can I know that I am a Christian? Wise people ask, how can I know that? Now, let's get more specific. How can I know, go to the second one there, how can I know that God has made me one of His own? Now, we who believe the Scripture, we believe very clearly that God has laid out very clearly that that it is through Christ that we come to become His own. It's through placing our faith not in ourselves but in Him that we actually become His children. But how can I know that? I mean, the stakes are rather high. Eternity is long. And the differences that the the Bible describes are quite vast differences. There's a third way of saying this. 
How can I know that when I die, I will be received and accepted by him? This wasn't only on James' mind, but this was on Jesus' mind, and that's probably, obviously, the reason it was on James' mind, because Jesus came teaching that you say that you know me, but you don't act like you know me. That's what he came saying to the Jewish people of the day. He came saying, you're very religious. You have all of the dress. You have the temple. You keep all of the feasts. But yet you don't know me, the creator of the universe, the savior potentially of your souls. And Jesus came saying, you better be careful to know what God has said and to do what God has said, James is echoing that message today to us. We've already looked at the passage. Uh, Tommy has read it. Notice here with me, fill this in, the various tests that we've looked at over the last few weeks are this. Number one, the first test is your response to trials. You remember that James begins, and you see it out there, verses 2 through 15, he begins by saying, consider it all joy, my brothers, whenever you encounter trials of various kinds. He's saying, if you want to know whether you're a Christian, how do you respond to trials? Do you run away from God when trials come, or do you run to God when trials come? There is part of the evidence. He's saying, do you ask God for wisdom? Do you call upon God knowing that He knows what's going on? And do you, do you run to Him and embrace Him when trial comes? Or do you run to despair? Christians run to God when trouble comes. Christians call upon, they, they know what God's Word has said, they know His promises, they've come to begin to trust in His good character when trouble comes. It's not that they don't hurt. It's not that they don't question. It's not that they don't wonder sometimes. All of these things are true, but true Christians, when the dust settles, they have run to God. This is what He calls us to do. The second trial that we see here is the trial um, of temptation. What is it that a Christian does when temptation comes? It's your response to temptation. Part of this we saw is the temptation to blame God for your trouble. Blame God for your sin. That's what Adam and Eve did. I mean, immediately Adam says, it's the woman you gave me. The woman says, it's the snake. Immediately there is there is blame shifting. True Christians don't. True Christians accept the reality of their sin, confess it to God. True Christians come to God, and here, here's what they do. They simply say, when trouble comes, when trials come, when sin and temptation come, I run to God. They don't do all of these things perfectly, but this is where things settle down to be with their lives. The third thing that I want you to see that cru true Christians do is that they respond to the implanted word as James 19, 20 and 21 says. Look at with me. We saw this passage last week. Verse 19 says, Know this, my beloved brothers. And this is up at the top of your sheet in the box. He says, Know this, my beloved br brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away, this is so important, therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive, notice what it says, with meekness, the implanted word. You know, it's interesting that meekness is just the opposite of anger. You see, we can either receive the word of God with meekness, or we can look at the word of God and be even angered by it. 
There's some people that when they hear the gospel and when they begin to read the Bible, they begin to say, I don't like this. I don't like the idea that there's a great big holy God and that I'm supposed to respond to him in humility. And it's because in our human hearts, we have our flesh that wants to be number one. We don't want to be submitted to God. Our flesh does not willingly submit by faith in God, by belief in His Word, by submission to His Word and to His will, we receive the Word implanted. And there's one of the big differences. There's right now a very angry world, and it's, and it's not just over the issues of a, the racial divide in America, which is sadly very, very real. But there's also the issues of radical Islam that is, that is seeking to, to spread itself and, and to wage war against Western civilization. And let, let me just say to you that what the events that we just saw over the last three days in Turkey is, is a very sad thing. Really, this coup attempt was the last attempt to keep the government of Turkey from becoming under a true Islamic regime. And the coup failed. You say, well, wait a minute. Those, those leaders were democratically elected. Let me just tell you that Islam is very patient. Islam will be glad to play by certain rules for a period of time until the power is, is in the control of radical Islam. And then, and then everything changes. Over the last 50 years, there has been a, a growing Islamic movement in the country of Turkey, certainly a, 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 an Islamic country, but not ruled by Islamic state government. But now we see, after, after several attempts over these years to keep that from happening, to keep it from becoming a religious government, those that are in power now want a religious regime. And as of this week, they took a major stride toward it. You see, the world rages, whether it's Islam, whether it's racial divides, whether it's there's, there's all kinds of other conflicts that we rarely even hear about in this present day and time, or whether it's the subtle things that we think are blessings like wealth and riches and, and all kinds of medical breakthroughs and everything else that we, that we often associate with increasing the quality of life very often distract us from God. And in our pride and our arrogance, the world very often says, no thanks to God. We can do it ourselves. I, I have no idea about the convention that is going to be held this week in Cleveland. I'm praying that, that God will bring peace and that God will allow the, the processes to, to go forward. But let me tell you that I, I'm concerned about that. But even though I may be concerned about what I see happening in Turkey and what I see, the, the atrocities in Paris, the atrocities in Orlando, the atrocities in Nice, France. I mean, there's, there's been many times that I've walked the promenade there in, in Nice where that truck mowed down. Mainly, um, proportionally, there's a higher number of children, excuse me, women and children who could not get out of the way of the truck. I mean, the, the insanity of this. You see, the world rages against God. But the wise person says, wait a minute. What is God doing? What has He said? How do I not run with the rage and all of the foolishness of the world, but instead receive with meekness, this is what it says in verse 21, receive in meekness the implanted word which is able to do what? Save your soul. This is the beauty of the gospel. God's truth, His truth planted in your heart will save your soul from the ravages of sin and the ravages of death. 
In fact, save your soul from the fires of hell. God is a merciful God because he saves even one. But the fact that he saves many and all who will believe is an amazing truth of the gospel. This is the great marvel that he would save even one. But here we see in this text that that those who receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. And then we see in verse 22 this, this proof of it. Look at verse 22 with me. But be doers of the word. Can you underline that on your outline there? Be doers of the word. And then put a box around and not hearers only. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. This is the big deal. These two words, a doer and a hearer, or the hearer only is the problem. Look what it does. The hearers only, what do they do? At the end of verse 22, it says that they what? They deceive themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. Verse 25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, this is the word of God, looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty. Amazing. Some people think, oh, Christianity, that's just to bind you down. It's to tell you what all you can't do. It's to, I, I don't want these shackles of being told what I can do and what I cannot do. I, I don't want, no, friend, listen, you've completely drank the devil's Kool-Aid. The devil's Kool-Aid is seeking to cause you to believe that the gospel, the word of God, is going to take away good things from you. Absolutely not. Au contraire. To the contrary, it is that God is bringing liberty to the captive soul. God is setting you free from the foolishness of this world and the foolishness of this age and the the temporary pleasures of this earthly life to the eternal pleasures of knowing your Creator and being right with Him. Indeed, Look with me in verse 25. The one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a, underline it, doer who what? A doer who acts. He will be blessed in what he's doing. So this is part two of this. Last week we looked at this issue of the the question of, of what is this angry response, not just to life, but especially to God's Word, versus the response of receiving God's Word gladly. And uh, now we see, how do we know? So, do you listen? Here's the first question there under number three. It says your response to the implanted Word. What is your response to the implanted Word? Do you listen to it? We looked at that last week. Do you receive it? We looked at that as well. Do you receive the word implanted which is able to save your soul? But then we come to this test of what do you do with it? You see, you are, you are either a hearer only or a hearer and a do, doer. And I ask you this morning, which one are you? I confess that I have great fear that there are many who sit not only in churches around the nation, but in churches in this city, and in fact, in this church, who they come and they hear, and they like to hear, they like the mental stimulation that is involved with that, they like hearing and and coming and looking at the things of God, but then somehow get up and leave having heard but not being affected by what the Word says. There are many who say, well, it's the right thing to go, to do, to go and listen. That's a good thing. But there's not, there's not a, a passionate response that brings about change in behavior, change in lifestyle, change in the the day-to-day decisions and the day-to-day values of our heart. We, We come and we hear, but then we go back out into the world 
for some, and they are unchanged. And the, the world continues on its, on its highway to hell, and there are many who, who just continue along on that ride. Having heard the word, but not doing anything with it. Jesus warned of this. He talks about the wheat and the tares. And the, the, the wheat and the tares, here's the idea. There's true wheat plants that are going to grow up, and then there's tares that are going to grow up that they look like wheat. And you can't even get in and take out the tares, the, the weeds that are there, because they look so similar. And it's not until the wheat comes up, the head of the wheat comes up and blossoms with grains of wheat, with fruit from it. It's not until there's, there's produce that you know that comes off the top of the wheat plant that you know whether this was the real deal or not. So it's, what is that produce? What is that fruit? What is that result? James is talking about the fact that that result is responding and doing what God's Word says. So as James is concerned about all of these religious folks coming into the early church, he's very concerned that they're, they're doing the religious thing like they've been doing for centuries having missed the heart message and the life message of the true gospel of Christ. And he, he, here's what happens. True Christians are truly encouraged by seeing and hearing this test. And those who have not yet come to Christ, it is my prayer, and it is, it is certainly John's, or James's aim that they would hear this, be alarmed, and respond to God. Well, how do they respond to God? Is it through an emotional, temp is it through an emotional um, invitation? Can we, get, can we get you to cry and pray a prayer of commitment? Can we get you to come and fill out a decision card? Can we even get you to go for a swim in our little swimming pool? in front of everybody. Is that, if, if, maybe if we get you to do those things, then everything will be okay. Oh no, what James is saying is it's far more than your re little, little religious things. Do, do you live what God has said? This is the test, and this is where the evidence is. And notice with me, I, I see on your outline here the, the true nature, fill this in, the true nature, character, heart of a person is only known by observing their conduct and their behavior. You, you can't really know someone just by looking, you just think about it with me, I, I can look here at um, Alexander, but I, I don't know what's really going on in Alexander's life. I mean, just by looking at him, I can't tell. He looks like a nice enough guy. Good. I, I love Brazilians. I married one. He's a Brazilian guy. I mean, I mean, I can look at him and I can say, "Wow, is it nice, upstanding guy? Has his family here and everything else." But it and but it's it's how Alexander lives his life in the whole of things that will reveal whether or not he knows God. Man looks on the outside. God looks at the heart. You see, Proverbs tells us in Proverbs 4.23, it says that from the heart springs life. From the heart comes the real issues of life. Keep your heart and with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. You see, it begins in the heart, but I can't see what the heart is. I can't know. There's even people who will say certain things that, oh yes, God has my heart, but then if they don't do what God says, that's part of what Jesus was, that was Jesus' big problem with the nation of Israel. Your lips even confess me, but your hearts are far from me. So there's this beautiful picture in the book of James of God bringing these two things together. And look with me at Matthew chapter 12, verse 33 through 35. This is Jesus speaking. And notice what he says. And you can just look at it on the screen. Either make the, excuse me, here's the picture. 
Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. So here's the picture. You, the tree is only known by whether it has good fruit or bad fruit. Now, the key verses are 34 and 35. Look what it says. You brood of vipers, Jesus speaking to the religious leaders around him. I mean, Jesus was not mincing words. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Verse 35, the good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. Here's the idea. In your heart, what is treasured in your heart? That is what's going to come out. I, I remember hearing a message by Billy Graham from 1957. Now, that was 11 years before I was born, so I, I'm not that old. But um, when I was in, not that there's anything wrong with being that old. Okay, enough of that. I heard a message that he preached to Urbana, which is a Christian conference around Christmas time in Illinois. And he had several thousand, maybe 10 or 20,000 students that were there. And he was preaching and talking about the importance of having a clean and pure heart before God. And he was saying that what comes out of your mouth is going to reveal what's in your heart. It was years later that Billy Graham would write in his own biography a, a real illustration of that in his own life. For whatever reasons and however it went, Billy Graham just sought to, to be a friend and an encouragement to many leaders in our nation. Every president, whether they were Republican or Democrat, he reached out to them and sought to encourage them. Really sought to share the gospel with them to see if they even understand the gospel. And in the process of that, because he was prominent, politicians tend to be drawn to anyone that's prominent because it's good for them, but for whatever their motivation, some of them were very open to him. And he would become friends with many of them, all the while hoping to influence them toward trusting in Christ. In the process of things, he became friends with Richard Nixon, a man who had Quaker roots, perhaps truly a godly mother. I don't know about Nixon's father, but certainly his mother. And while they became friends, they would golf together. He would go up to Camp David and stay sometimes. He would visit him in the Oval Office in the midst of crises, he would be called in to, to pray and to be there very often, and so they became friends. And in the process of that, they would, they would often pray, even through Richard Nixon's great political troubles. Years later, you remember with me that there were tapes that were made of the conversations in the Oval Office. Do you remember what they were called? The, the Watergate tapes. And as a result of those tapes, they were, they, were, they were not made public for many, many years. Eventually, the text of those tapes, and in fact, the recordings of those tapes were made available. You can even listen to them today. In the process of that, Billy Graham listened to the tapes or portions of the tapes, and when he heard the foul language that was coming out of Richard Nixon's mouth in private, he said he was so sickened by it, he was so discouraged by it, he was so upset about it, he had to go to the bathroom and throw up because he was so hurt. And here's why he quoted this verse. The mouth speaks out of the abundance of the heart. Your tongue will show what's in your heart. Does vile words come out of your heart? Does, does all kinds of sexual innuendo come out of your heart? Reveals, I mean, come out of your mouth? It reveals that that's in your heart. Does anger and hostility come out of your mouth? It reveals what's in your heart. Does racism and prejudice come out of your mouth? It reveals what's in your heart. You see, does any number of things 
that come out of our mouths, it comes to reveal the condition of our heart. Fill this in. Our words and actions flow from our heart. Our words and actions flow from our heart, if you haven't already. And you see, true followers of Christ are called to obey His commandments. That's what they're called to do. James 15 and verse 14, James chapter 15, 14, Jesus says it. You are my friends if you do what I command you. You, I mean, if you do what I command you, you are my friends. And there's a word that's in there that's a very tiny two-letter word. If. You're my friends if you do what I command you. Look at the next one. In John chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and he will come to him and make our home with him. Do you see that? God will come and camp out with you. He will be with you in your your life if you keep his words. It's going to reveal that. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, another very short little book of the Bible that packs a put packs a great punch. In 1 John chapter 2 verse 3 says, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. You say, well, isn't that just like the other one? Yes. The point is this. It says it over and over again from John's gospel to Mark's gospel to Luke's gospel to the letters of John. Jesus is making clear that the way that we live reveals whether or not we are truly his children, and that is exactly what James is hammering. You see, just fill this in at the top on your back side, on the back side of that, that sheet that's there. A sure sign you are not a follower of Christ is that you do not keep his commands. This is a sure sign that you do not know the Lord. It's not a sure sign that you are sitting in church. I believe that if you're a Christian, you're going to be at church. I do believe that. But just because you are here doesn't mean that you're truly a Christian. Um, Notice here with me, in John 14, verse 24, it says, He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. He's saying, this is the Father's words to you, that you better love me, and the way that you love me is by keeping my words. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 4. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments, wow, is what? A liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, I want you to notice in 1 John chapter 2, verse 4, it is possible to say, I have come to know him, but that not be true. It is possible for someone to confess Christ with their lips and deny Him with their life. In fact, fill it in. It's not an issue of claiming to be a Christian. It's an issue of living as a Christian. Cultural Christianity would exalt over the last hundred years in our country, would often exalt this idea of being a cultural Christian, just kind of going with the flow with the Christian culture. When in fact, that could be merely claiming without living the truth. Look at 1 John chapter 3 and verse 10 on your outline. By this the children of God and the children of the devil. So there's one of the, one of the two, either the children of God or the children of the devil. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. You can see it. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. You see, in our emphasis on the grace of God and salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, we can often skip over the reality that true Christians obey God. For what I mean by that, for those who have not been around church for a long time, 
There's something called works-based salvation and grace-based salvation, and the common deception in much of the world is if you do the right thing, you'll be accepted by God. So the more you do of the right thing, then you are gaining acceptance by God. That is patently false and not how we are saved. We are saved only by the grace of God, the, the, the flowing, unmerited forgiveness of God found through Jesus Christ, faith in Jesus Christ. Well, as we emphasize grace works, excuse me, as we emphasize salvation by grace alone, through faith alone in Christ alone, we can often walk away from verses like this that say, hey, if you don't live in righteousness, it shows you're not a, you're not a child of God. You can say whatever you want to say. You can go sit in a nice air-conditioned room once a week, but it, then go live like the devil the rest of the week, or, or simply not live in, in submission to God. You say, well, I don't live like the devil, so I must be okay. I mean, I, I do good on my own. The big question is, do you obey God? Well, I don't even know. What do you mean? How, do I obey God? How would I even know? Well, then there's another question. Are you in His Word? Do you know what His Word says? You see, you, you won't obey God because you don't, you don't know how to obey Him because if you're not in His Word, being in the Word, listening to the Word of God is how we come to know what He wants in order for us to obey. That's why we have to be hearers of the Word. But James is saying not only a hearer of the Word, but what? A, a doer of the Word. Fill this in. Our obedience does not earn our status as children of God. Our obedience does not earn our status as children of God, uh, children of God. But it does reveal our status as children of God. So your works won't save you. Your works won't cause you to be a child of God. Only the grace of God can do that through faith in Christ on your part, but your works will reveal whether or not you know God. And again, let's read 1 John 3.10 out loud together. Are you ready? Everybody clear your throat. Are you ready? <clears> throat> 1 John 3.10, good and loud, it's right there in the middle of your page. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. The one who does not love his brother, nor the one who does not love his brother. You know, it's interesting that last phrase that it's there, by the way, God, God said that they came to him and they said, what are the great commandments? What's the greatest commandment? And he said, um, the greatest commandment is to love God. You didn't ask for it, but the second greatest commandment, number two, is to love your neighbor as yourself. On this, these two things, all of the prophet, all of the law and all of the prophets hinge on these two things, love God and love the people around you. You know, there's nothing in there about love yourself. Our culture today has made the greatest commandment just love yourself. Be true to yourself. You be true to you and everything else will be okay. Well, actually, all of Scripture shows us that the, uh, the opposite of that is true. If you will love God and if you will love others, you will be at peace with yourself. A peace that nothing in this world can give. Okay, there is a great illustration of this whole thing of of are you a hearer only or are you a hearer and a doer? And it comes from the Old Testament. It's Nehemiah and the people, the Jews, being restored to Jerusalem. You remember with me, and you can see these outlines that are here. The Jews, they had been hauled off in exile, but notice this. The Jews returned to Jerusalem from exile in Babylon. Jerusalem is in what? Ruins. It's destroyed. The Jews first rebuild the temple, that's under Zerubbabel, and you can remember that by Zerubbabel worked out of the rubble 
um, those, the rubble of the temple, Zerubbabel, rebuilt that led the people, but then God brought along an amazing leader for his people to, to lead them to miraculously perform an extraordinary task. You see, they rebuilt, the, the first thing that they did was rebuild the temple. That was the right thing to do. These were people who'd been hauled off. They'd been around other gods. They'd been around all other kingdoms exalting other things, and all they wanted to do was get home to Zion, get home to the city of Jerusalem. They just wanted to get back to their land, and they wanted to worship God in peace. And so they rebuilt the temple first, but they were vulnerable to the armies around them. They were vulnerable. The walls weren't rebuilt yet. And so amazingly, the walls were rebuilt. Notice this, the Jews rebuild the wall in only 52 days. God's people are restored to their land, that God restored the people to the land. But in Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 through 12, and then even in chapter 9 and in chapter 10, we see an amazing thing. Spiritual revival comes. So they rebuilt the temple, amazingly, they rebuild the wall, and then that is finished, and they are, they're exhausted, but they're, they're finally back home and they're safe. And then God does a great work. Can you take your Bible and turn with me over to Nehemiah? And we're going to close with this. I want you to see this. This is powerful. If you don't know where Nehemiah is, just go to your table of contents and look that up. That's fine, but you are going to need to look at it. And if you're in a red pew Bible, pew Bible you want to go to page 510. Page 510. Nehemiah chapter 8. As a child growing up, I remember hearing Pastor Billingsley say that one of the most beautiful sounds in the world is hearing God's people turn in the pages of their Bible in the words of life to hear from God. Look at Nehemiah Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 1. So the, the wall is finished, and here we go. Nehemiah 8, 1. And all the people gathered as one man in the square before the water gate. So there was a gate to the city. That's a a walled city. And there was a, a gate that was there right by a source of water. So they gathered by the water gate. And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. Isn't that interesting? The people called on Ezra, their priest, to bring the law of Moses. And here's the the book of Moses is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's the Pentateuch. It's the story of God's work in their history, and it's the law that God had given them that they may know Him. And so finally they're out of the pagan lands of Babylon. They're finally back in their city, and they call for their priest to bring the word to them. Verse 2, so Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard. So the little babies were not necessarily there. This implies the first nursery, perhaps, is being kept somewhere. So there's some that are keeping a nursery. We're very thankful for those who are keeping the babies over on the other side of the wall here. But for those who could understand, here they're brought together and they hear the word, on the first day of the seventh month, verse 3. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and women and of those who could understand. So we're talking six hours he read. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Verse 4, and Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform, similar to this. They had made a wooden platform. Look at verse 4. And Ezra the scribe stood on the wooden platform that they had made for this purpose. 
And beside him stood, and then he goes through priests that are there next to him. Look at verse 5. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and he opened it, and all the people stood. Verse 6, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen and Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped in the, the Lord with their faces to the ground. And again, it says the Levites, there's all of these names that are here in verse 7 are the Levite priests, help the people to understand the law. That's so interesting. These priests help them to understand what had been read. That's what we're doing now. The preaching of the Word, the explanation of the Word, the expositional preaching and teaching of God's Word is exactly what we see God's people are doing 4,000 years ago, or excuse me, um, 2,500 years ago. Look at verse 8. And they read from the book, from the law of God, Clearly, and they gave the sin, and they gave the sense so the people understood the reading. And then, so this is the picture of what they did. They called on the word to be there and to be proclaimed. And then look at the response in verse nine. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and the scribe and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, "This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep." For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Now listen to this. God's Word is proclaimed to them, and they begin to see the holiness of God. That's what God's Word does. It reveals who God is and who we are not. And the people begin to weep because they begin to see that they were an unclean people. They were a people who had who had been out of the sacrifices of the law. These were people who had been in, in exile amongst, amidst pagan nations, and they see the holiness of God, and there's a great sorrow as they see how holy He is and how sinful they are. And we see these beautiful words that Ezra comes to them and says, today is not a day of weeping, but we see the grace of God. We see the holiness of God. Do not be grieved, he says in verse 10. He says, then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who does not have this, for this day is holy to the Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed the people, saying, be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way and eat and ate, excuse me, went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they understood the words that were declared to them. Now part of what we see also unfolds in verse chapter nine is that they confess their sins to God. They confess and they repent of their sins to God, and they begin to rejoice in who He is. And all the way to chapter 10 and verse 39, we see this whole thing unfold. Turn with me over to chapter 10, and I want you to see, we'll start in verse 28, and I just want you to see this. So they, they confess their sins in chapter 9. In chapter 10, they see God calling them to be keepers. Look at this in verse 28. The rest of the people, the priests and the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the, the temple servants, and all who had separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God, their wives and their sons and their, their daughters, all who have knowledge and understanding, and here's what they did in verse 29, join with their brothers, their nobles, and enter into a curse, into an oath to walk in God's law. You say, they entered into a curse to walk in God's law? Here's the idea. Here's what they were saying. If I don't keep God's law, I will be cursed. I understand that. I make an oath to keep God's law. Look what it says in verse 29. A curse and an oath 
to walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and to do all the commandments of the Lord our God and His rules and His statutes. And the rest of chapter 10 just reveals where that all goes. Take your outline and fill this in. First of all, God's Word is read and taught to the people. That's chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. But then the people have a threefold response to God. And this is so important for you to understand because this plays right into what James is trying to warn us of and trying to teach us. The first response is confession or sorrow over their sin. So God's Word is read to them and taught to them. They see their need. And so they confess their sorrow over sin. Second response is the celebration of forgiveness. Don't don't any longer be sorrowful. Here's the picture. Give thanks. Celebrate God's forgiveness. Celebrate His goodness. This is what Christians can do. Christians confess their sin. Instead of of disagreeing with it, they agree that they are sinful and in need of a Savior. But then we celebrate in that. But notice the third one. In chapter 10, we find that they make a covenant to obey. They make a covenant to obey. They make a massive binding commitment. That's the picture. And it's not just words, but it's to keep the law of God. You see, people who hear the Word of God and make some type of light commitment to it that is ignored on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or the rest of their lives are simply revealing that they do not know God. And James is sounding the alarm saying, let that not be you. Many of you can remember hearing perhaps a pastor or a preacher or an evangelist in your years growing up making a very impassioned appeal, seeking to try to convince you to give your life to Jesus, to make a commitment. I remember that we would have a cross and we would, we would write our sins on, the, on pieces of paper and then they would go and we would nail them to the cross. And there would be a, an object lesson in that, that our sins were nailed to the cross, and there'd be a, a plea for a commitment to that. Is that a bad thing to do? No, that's not a bad thing to do. It can be a reminder, it can be a revealer of, of our, our sins having nailed Christ to the cross. Or some would say that, that their camp, when they were growing up, that you, know, you go find a pine cone, and that pine cone represents your life, and you're gonna, you're just, if, if you are ready to commit your life to Christ tonight at the campfire, if you are ready to do that, if you, you know, and there's this impact passion plea, and you're going to go and you're going to throw the pine cone in the fire, and it's going to be your symbol of commitment to that and so forth. Friends, there, there's many times when we are depending on some event or something that we did, some service that we went to, some card that we filled out. Listen, the little card, the little pine cone, the little note of your sins nailed to the cross Those are not going to reveal in the long run whether or not you know Jesus. Don't look back to those events. What you need to look to is the obedience of your life or the disobedience of your life. That is what reveals whether or not you know God. Do you listen to His Word? Do you listen to what He says? And do you do it? Are you pursuing Him? We live in a fallen world that's gone nuts, and and the world that's gone nuts around us is saying, you, 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 you. And you can live your life for entertainment. You can live your life for all of the things of this present experience. Or you can choose to look past all of these things into eternity, what God 
wants you to see, what God wants you to do, and you can choose to say, like Moses, I do not consider these earthly things worthy of my life. I follow Christ. Moses esteemed the truth of walking with God greater riches than staying with Pharaoh in Pharaoh's house. And he identified with the nation of Israel instead of the nation of Egypt. He was, the, he was the Pharaoh's son. He could have whatever he wanted. He could rule Egypt. Instead, he chose to go with the people of God. My question is for you. Do you choose to go with the people of God? It will reveal whether or not you know God. You say, well, I'm here. Well, I hope you're hearing me say it's more than just being here. It's how you live your days. It's what the values of your heart are. It's, it's do you serve others? Do you, do you look at others through the eyes of God? Do you, do you come to rein in your sensuality and your sexuality and say, no, I live for God, not myself and not my own pleasures? All that God gives you through work. You know, Deuteronomy 8.18 says it's the Lord your God who gives you the power to make wealth. It's not you. It's God that gives that gift to you. And all that you have, is it His or is it yours? We've talked about the fact that money often comes up because it's such an indicator of where we are or where we're not. Do we spend our lives on ourselves? Do we spend it on God's kingdom, all that we are. Luke 6, 46 says this, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Wow. You see, the defining difference is not a momentary, emotional, or whimsical commitment. But the defining difference is long-term obedience. Do you obey? How does this look? What does this look like? Here, it, it, it's true. You're here. Praise God. Some of you are saying, wow, that was kind of intense. I didn't realize. I thought I, th I, thought it would, I would be commended for being here, not questioning my pornography problem or my greed problem or my other problems during the week. I thought that this would just be encouraging and so forth. Listen, here's the encouraging thing, that faith in Jesus Christ can save you from your sins. <laughs> And that, that's the encouraging thing. And faith in Jesus Christ will be revealed. If you truly have belief in Jesus, then you're going to do what he says. And as you do what he says, you're going to find the joy of your master. And if you do what he says, and you have true faith in Christ, and it's revealed in how you live your life, when you die, you will be welcomed into the kingdom of God as saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. May we follow Christ in obedience. Now today, my challenge to you is, do you know Christ? Follow him in obedience. Um, some of you have gone back and forth with sin over and over and over again that you've never let go of. And let me just tell you that um, I believe that God is calling you to say, Lord, I'm yours, and my sin is yours. I give it all to you. I will obey. That thing that you've been convicting me about, that thing that you've been laying on my heart, I surrender it to you because I want to be one who is not only a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word as well. Would you stand with me for prayer?